So um, today I'm going to give you guys a lightning tour of different technologies. Um, so when you go back to the office, you know just enough to debunk your, your fellow coders when they tell you that you should upgrade or you should use blockchain or you should use serverless or you should use some new hot technology because we're all busy coders. How many, how many folks in this room are busy? Okay, very good. And I'm, I'm also super busy. So one question you might ask is like, if you're traveling the world, if you're running developer marketing and developer relations teams, when do you have time to, to write talks like this? And I will show you the answer to that with a video. So between stops in the city, we would chat about technical topics over the radio, um, discuss what we thought about you know, emerging technologies and our personal opinions about them, and then the slides would be written for the user group we were going to present at for each of the different sections. Um, and the great thing about being on a motorcycle, you can't take meetings, it's hard to take phone calls, like everyone leaves you alone. So this is my tip, if you're too busy to write a presentation, go on a motorcycle tour and then you can, you can talk about stuff like this. So we're going to cover six technology topics today. We're going to cover blockchain, chatbots, serverless, containers, DevOps, and machine learning and AI. And anybody in the audience is an expert in all six of these? Okay, I saw, I saw a couple people hesitant. It's okay if you're an expert on all of these. You can help me with the next version of the talk. So come see me afterwards and give me a hand. But hopefully everyone's going to learn a little bit about something new, something which they didn't, they didn't learn about before. And um, we're going we're to start with, with number one on um, hot technology trends, which may or may not apply to you, which is blockchain. Um, blockchain is not, is not this. Right? Blockchain is the underlying technology behind Bitcoin. But I think Bitcoin has mostly popularized the technology, where cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum are what most of us have as our first introduction to blockchain. And how many, how many folks in the audience have some Bitcoins? Don't be shy, raise your hands. Okay, so you guys who raised your hands, you owe us all a beer. Because one, block, one Bitcoin at its peak was worth almost 20,000 US dollars. So I think, I think you can afford to buy, there's not, there's not 20,000 people in the audience here. You can afford a beer for all of us, right? Just sell, just sell one of your Bitcoins. It's illegal. It's illegal. Not <laughs> Bitcoin's not illegal. It's not legal in India. Is, is Ethereum legal in India? No, no digital currencies are legal in India. OK, so, so don't tell anybody that your friends are now criminals. Because <laughs> we're all, this is like um, conference NDA. Okay, we're all friends here. Don't get, your, don't get your friends thrown in jail. But you can see that this went through a lot of a big hype stage. There's no intrinsic value to, to Bitcoin, right? The, the value is in its use as a trade currency. Um, it reached a huge peak and then it dropped off and now it's on the rise again. Um, digital currencies are incredibly useful because they, they give us a way to exchange money that um, crosses over international borders that allows you to do trade with, with less oversight, and it allows you to do a lot of transactions which otherwise wouldn't be possible. Um, the downside is that it's incredibly energy inefficient because the, the basic mechanism that Bitcoin uses for arbitration, for consensus algorithms, is on mining proof of work. So basically you have a bunch of miners. You, you guys probably heard about like huge operations of of using, um, using GPUs or using um, other processing um, ASICs to do advanced mining. They throw a lot of hardware resources at this. By throwing hardware resources at Bitcoin mining, you're rewarded with some Bitcoin yourself. So it ends up being lucrative to a point, right? The value of the currency 
determines how much the value of mining is worth. And as the value of Bitcoin has risen, um, so has the number of miners to, to a peak of 75 terawatt hours per year. And even though the, um, the value of the currency isn't at its peak, the amount of mining has still gone up to 75 um, terawatt hours per year again. So it is quite expensive from an energy consumption standpoint. An easier way of thinking about this is thinking in, in terms of households. So um, this would be equivalent, the total usage of Bitcoin would be equivalent to 7 million US households of energy consumption. So that's a lot of light bulbs that you're putting on whenever you use cryptocurrencies. Ethereum's more efficient, but it's also a smaller network currently, so around a million US households. And Ethereum in particular is, um, they're implementing a new algorithm which should be much lower um, um, utilization of energy resources and harder to game with ASICs and other advanced processing. Um, but the most efficient mechanism is something which I think most of us have in our wallet, which is, is this, the old, good old fashioned credit card. So Visa uses comparatively no energy for transactions compared to Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, so you can consider if you, if you use your credit card for transactions or cash, you're an environmentalist. So thank you for saving the environment. Um, another analogy for this is it's the same energy consumption as, all right, anyone want to shout out? What's this country? Very good, Venezuela. Um, so the, the whole country of Venezuela consumes about the same energy as Bitcoin and Ethereum put together at present. But obviously, cryptocurrency energy consumption is going up, whereas Venezuela is not turning on that many more light bulbs. Um, but what we really care about as technologists is the underlying um, technology, which is um, Bitcoin, or, or blockchain, rather. And the way blockchain works is it acts as a distributed ledger. Um, there is a series of blocks which make up your ledger that are sequential. And the way you determine the next block in the blockchain is you hash together all of your transactions in a Merkle tree, so you're hashing those transactions with each other until you get a single combined hash value. You're taking the previous block's hash, you're taking a timestamp, you're taking a nonce, and this is the next candidate block in the blockchain, and the network, um, in the case of Bitcoin, mining proof of work, um, is what determines the next valid block in the blockchain. So what this does is this gives you a distributed ledger, it's validated by the network, it's consensus across everyone, and it's a great way of creating a system where untrusted parties can do transactions. Um, Bitcoin and Ethereum are mostly considered public blockchain networks, although Ethereum also has private blockchain, which we'll talk about in a sec. And um, there's several characteristics of public blockchain which probably make it not the best choice for um, enterprise problems you may have to solve. One of them is that fact that you have only seven transactions per second, and it's a 10 minute completion time for Bitcoin. So if you can think about it, if you had to wait 10 minutes for a completion time of an enterprise um, transaction, that would probably be unacceptable by most clients. Um, Ethereum, Ethereum speeds this up, so it's 15 transactions per second, 15 second completion time, again, not the fastest. Um, you're also limited in the data in a transaction. Um, blockchain has a somewhat controversial one megabyte block size, which was introduced by the founder at some point with some hidden check-ins. Ethereum has a gas limit, which varies based on the network. Um, the current gas limit, when I checked it a couple nights ago, was about um, 10 million gas is what you could do. And the way of thinking about gas is it's related to the cryptocurrency, but it's, um, it's somewhat separated. And you're essentially, you're paying in um, cryptocurrency for use of the network resources. Um, and you're limited in terms of the total um, amount of processing you can use, which affects how you do smart contracts. So if you want to do additional processing to um, execute some code and execute a smart contract in the network, the complexity of the contract is limited um, by your gas size in the Ethereum network. On the other hand, if you do private blockchain, you can control the network reconciliation technique, so maybe by consensus or by some other arbitration mechanism. You can choose who's part of your network. You can get much shorter transaction times. The amount of data you can put in a transaction is unlimited. It's, it's your choice. 
Um, you can do smart contracts. And then you get privacy, which is probably the biggest difference and something you need if you're going to use it for, um, for supply chain, for financial, for other use cases which involve sensitive data. Um, probably the most popular technologies for implementing blockchain would be either Hyperledger Fabric, which is super configurable, pluggable, and is an Apache project. It does consensus at the transaction level, has um, pluggable modules for just about everything. You can do your smart contracts in Go or JavaScript with modules for other languages that can be plugged in. So you can do pretty much any language you want for smart contracts. And you can even use Solidity, which is the um, Ethereum smart contract language, by using Sawtooth, which is another plugin. Um, and you can do cryptocurrency with chain code. R3 Corda is really more specialized for the financial industry. It's an open source project now. Um, it's primarily used when you have to do smart contracts in a financial industry. They allow Java, Kotlin, or other JVM languages, but it's not really designed for cryptocurrency purposes. And then the last one is Ethereum, which is becoming increasingly popular for private blockchain as well. And in the case of Ethereum, you do your smart contracts in a DSL called Solidity, but that's not that much different from Java or Python. You have ledger level mining proof of work. And there's a built-in cryptocurrency, because obviously it, it is a cryptocurrency itself. So um, these are some of the implementations you might use. And here are some of the industries which you might find yourself using blockchain for. So financial services, financial ledgers, trading, payment processing, global transactions, legal. If you have to do smart trans contracts with defined rules, automated ex actions, expiration date, and access to participating parties. Uh, medical and healthcare or IoT use cases. And one example of IoT use cases is a project that I did with the local brewery um, to automate the supply chain for um, brewing beer. Anyone here like beer? All right, so I think, I think beer, beer and blockchain, that's the, the ultimate hype, right? So here's a short video about the project. Okay, so Alpha Acid Brewing is actually a little microbrewery right down the street from me. We stuck a bunch of IoT sensors right in the brewery, collected data, did a supply chain blockchain use case. So we got information from upstream suppliers like the, um, the hops, the malts, and the yeast, which go in to make the beer. And they're all local businesses, which normally if you had the beer, you wouldn't know about what was going into the beer. And then you could scan a little QR code on the beer and get information about what was going into the beer. So this is a supply chain use case for blockchain. You have your financials, IoT. Um, and then for everything else, if you're not in one of those industries, there's actually a really good solution. Has anyone ever used one of these? Relational database? OK, <laughs> a few folks. Um, blockchain actually is overkill for a lot of things. If you don't have untrusted parties, if you don't have like a large network of folks you need to have in the um, transactions, Probably it's, it's going to cost you more, and it's going to be more difficult to implement for a lot of different use cases. Um, so you know a little bit about blockchain. Next time your coworker says we should use blockchain on our, on our um, project, maybe, maybe a database is OK. All right, so next technology we're going to chat about is chatbots. So um, when, you, when you think about chatbots, you probably think about some cute little robot like this guy, right? Or maybe. Maybe a robot bartender. Um, you can watch the full video. This is pretty cool at futurestates.tv. They have um, eight different little um, futuristic videos. One of them is about a robot bartender um, who's, who's breaking the robot laws and, and doing bad things. 
Um, more likely, this is the chatbots you're actually going to see. It's going to be something boring like um, an interaction with text chatbots on Facebook, WeChat, Slack, Line, maybe WhatsApp. What, what's, what's the most popular text-based messenger here in India? OK, WhatsApp. I should probably add WhatsApp to the slide. Um, this is probably your first interaction. And it'll probably be something mundane like, you know, buying flowers or um, booking flights or um, maybe getting ordery of, um, you know, food delivery or something like that. So like transactions that you do online. And hopefully you have a great experience. Um, maybe sometimes not. And so one of the things with chatbots is chatbots are typically programmed by us, geeks. And then we enter in rules, and we enter in certain words we're looking for, and it probabilistically ca calculates what's the most likely thing which the person was answering. Um, you, you often want to not lead your end user towards specific menus, or you end up in a situation where they're trying to say something, and you're not understanding the conversation. Your chatbot is, um, you know, by, by human standards, being stupid. And um, more likely in the future, or even today, you're going to be seeing chatbots with um, some sort of um, voice activation. So how many folks have a, a Google Assistant or Alexa in their house? OK, what, what do you guys use that for? Just shout it out. OK, so I think the number one use case is, is music, because um, Picking songs and having a good speaker in your house is, is pretty good, right? You buy one of these as a toy, and then it turns into the best speaker you have in your house. Um, I tried to actually use one of these as a, an alarm clock for my daughter. Um, she actually helps me teach kids' workshops now. And there's, there's a fundamental flaw with chatbots for an alarm clock, which is you can turn it off with your voice, and you'll never wake up. You just yell, shut up, Alexa. And then you're, you're, you sleep entirely through your meeting. Um, how about a reverse chatbot? So this is some footage from um, Google Next. Oh, and that's a cue for our audio text again. Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 115. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. Okay. So um, you can see that it's a little bit freaky when computers start sounding like us. Little pauses, little, you know, um, fluctuations in voice. Um, this was so scary that Google, right after um, showing this, quickly said that they're going to make sure their chatbots announce that they're a robot before they continue the conversation. Um, and actually, one of the things they use this for is if you, if you go on Google and you look for like open store hours or if you look for services, they use chatbots as a way of collecting that information from businesses rather than having humans do the work. Um, another potential chatbot could be a, a robot like Pepper. And so Pepper is a robot built by Aldebaran Robotics, um, a French robotics company for SoftBank, which is a Japanese company that acquired them. Um, it can do voice interactions. It's actually designed for, for helping like, um, for patients, for doing point of sale business to welcome folks into store. And it also works as a great human interaction. Um, Pepper's little brother is called Now. And um, I do a bunch of kids' workshops. Um, as I mentioned, my daughter actually mostly took, the, took this over for me. Now she does the kids' workshops. And um, now is one of the things which really gets kids excited, because they can program, they can script the robot, they can interact with the robot. 
And it's a lot of fun for kids to then see a physical manifestation of what they're interacting with. And it's a great way of opening up technology. And also, at this age, you get a much better mix of men and women um, who are interested, or girls and boys who are interested in technology. So it's a great way to get the next generation to improve our um, gender equality in the high-tech industry. OK. And then if, if your robots don't work, then you can always fall back and just make them dance. OK, so the next technology topic we're going to talk about is serverless technology. This is not serverless. You don't throw away all your machines, right? What serverless is, is actually, it's, if anything, it's more servers, we're just, and we're automatically provisioning them. So rather than buying a bunch of servers up front or hosting your own data center or even just buying virtual machines or physical machines, what you do instead is you create little micro functions. You pay just for the server time those micro functions are executing, and it will immediately tear them down afterwards, so you're not paying for them. And then you get scalability in large global cloud um, instances, so your latency is the distance from your customer to the nearest cloud node. So often this reduces latency of your application and allows you to scale from a small startup with um, only a few transactions to a huge um, multinational global company um, with a very um, um, highly utilized service which needs to be everywhere. And the, the ideal is that as you scale up the number of servers, that you're only paying for the time you use. So compared to, to buying fixed infrastructure or buying fixed um, compute instances in the cloud, you're going to save money. All that green is saved money, right? OK, so this, this is a lie. <laughs> Actually, anytime you see a graph in a presentation at a conference, you pretty much should assume there's something wrong with it. And so there's probably multiple things wrong with this graph, but the, the most egregious one is I, I drew the slope of the line wrong. So when you buy serverless from your typical cloud provider, it actually looks more like this. Um, after you reach a certain scale, you're in the red, you're not in the green, because the, the per cost on a, on a function basis is much higher than if you actually just ran it in a microservice or you ran it on your own Kubernetes instance. Um, so that said, you're still getting different advantages, right? So you're getting scalability, you're getting geographic um, um, diversity, you're, you're getting automatic deployment across the globe, and you're getting the usage of a, of a lot of scalability and um, instance, instant um, um, capacity, which otherwise would be hard to do yourself. And there's a bunch of different platforms you can do this with. So for example, um, AWS Lambda, is anyone using this? Okay, quite a number of folks. Um, anyone using Google Cloud Functions? Okay, a couple. And how about, how about Azure Functions? Okay, quite a number of folks. Now, a couple years ago, it primarily would have been Lambdas and not as much Azure or Google Cloud. And you can see that the other, um, the other companies are catching up. And part of the reason for that, we're at an open source conference. Open source matters, right? That's why you're here. And if you look at how open the different platforms on, are, Azure is the most open. They actually open source their entire core. So you can run it locally, you can inspect the source code, and you know exactly what the serverless environment you're running on is doing. Um, Google Cloud Functions gives you an emulator, so it's, it's better, but it's not exactly the same as what you're running in production, and Amazon Lambdas is the most proprietary. They were first, but they, they um, also are the most proprietary, and you don't really know what you're running on. You don't have the same capability to run it locally. Um, there's also another option for how you run your serverless functions, and that is to go, actually, I, let me mention this first. So this is the language support by different cloud providers. Um, and this tells you which languages they support. And this is also interesting, where you can see there's an obvious bias here. So almost everyone supports Node.js, Java, and Python, or is planning on supporting those, because they have large language communities, and they're relatively vendor neutral. Um, Microsoft doesn't support um, Go, because it's a, it's a Google language. Um, and the same thing, Google doesn't support .NET, because it's a Microsoft technology. <laughs> so some, some obvious biases. 
Um, and then Ruby, Amazon supports for some reason, and then nobody else cares about. Sorry, sorry for the Ruby hackers in the audience. Maybe you can run JRuby on the Java virtual machine. Okay, but another option is just go open source. And there's a lot of good open source serverless frameworks where it's entirely open source. You can run it locally. You can run it on your own compute instances or even in a Kubernetes cluster which you manage. And um, some of these actually have a managed service associated with them too where you can run it in somebody else's cloud and get the scalability characteristics of a much, much larger cloud than you can build yourself. Um, so if you want to go entirely open source, this is, this is the way to do it. Um, and then if you, if you use open source serverless like this, you have another option for scalability as well. And I'm going to call this own serverless. So basically you can start out in a managed instance to a certain scale, and then once you hit the threshold where you can save money by running it yourself, spin up your own instances or a Kubernetes cluster, which we'll talk about in a bit, and then you get to follow the red line and just pay for the capacity you're using. So potentially this also is a way where you get even better scalability, cost-effective scalability than you would get by using somebody else's serverless cloud. And then the top five reasons you need serverless because but if your sysadmin quit, I think this also is the reason you need DevOps, which we'll, we'll get to in a sec. Um, all the cloud providers give you a million or two million free queries. Um, now the dirty secret is that runs out really quickly and then you become a paying customer. So don't believe the hype. If you're already doing microservices and you want even more complexity. So for folks who are doing serverless in the audience, do you, is it easier? or harder than traditional monolith development? What do you guys think? Easier? OK, I heard, I heard a few easiers. Raise your hands. Easier? And then who thinks it's harder? Serverless actually is harder. OK, so the, the harders win, but it was pretty split. And so the way of thinking about this, there was a good tweet about this, like yesterday. Um, serverless doesn't actually, if you can't write a well-structured monolith application, you also probably can't write a well-structured set of microservices or serverless to do exactly the same thing. So the same engineering principles for scalability which apply to building monolithic applications, that discipline, having the right, um, the right APIs, having the right separation, having a good application design, if you can't get those right in that monolith, you're not going to be much more successful on serverless. You're also going to have more troubles with state. Um, serverless applications have really short memories. And then the best reason of all, someone else is paying the bills. We just want to use the latest hype technology. This is the number one reason to do blockchain, do serverless, do all the technologies I'm talking about. Because as geeks, we love using new technologies. OK, and speaking of new technologies, how many folks are doing containers in the audience? All right, very good. So again, that, that's, that was almost half the audience. And a few years ago, this was a new concept, so we're, we're doing good in keeping up with technologies which matter. Um, historically, this is how we build apps, right? Bare metal, just build straight on the server hardware, deploy one application or a couple applications to an environment. Um, not that easy to maintain, not that easy to use, but the best performance, because you're running on straight on the bare metal. Actually, this has come back slightly, so a lot of cloud providers allow bare metal instances now. Virtual machines came out and this revolutionized the world because we could run multiple concurrent workloads on our machines. The problem was that we're emulating an entire operating system. We have this whole layer in the middle and no matter how well the chipset enables and supports virtual machines, you're still losing a lot of efficiency. So along came um, Linux containers and this allowed a whole new class of applications with a very lightweight container runtime, which lets you look like you're running in your own process, your own environment, but you're actually not. You're just running on the base operating system with, with a little bit of um, voodoo happening in the middle to make it seem like you have your own environment. And so this allows us to run a bunch of different applications to package up our packages and our application into little deployments units deploy our images to different pods that are running inside of our container runtime, and then we get the advantages of a virtual machine with almost the same speed benefits of running on bare metal, right? So this is the ideal. 
we get our speed, but we don't lose the ability to um, compartmentalize things and run lots of things on the same machine. And hopefully you end up with a, a very seaworthy ship. Actually, let's, let's go to, the, here's an example of some of the container runtimes. So um, Docker, there's a bunch of other open source ones, RKT, CRIO, Podman's a new one, ContainerD, Kata Containers. So you actually have a lot of choices um, besides just Docker for your container runtime. And then you hopefully get set up a nice seaworthy ship where you run all your containers in. So um, here's, here's my, my ship. How many folks want to take a ride on my ship? All right, brave. <laughs> we have a lot of brave folks in the audience. So I gave this presentation in Japan a couple nights ago. Only one person would come on my ship. They're, they're very uptight in Japan. They, they thought there was something wrong with my ship. And they're, they're right because you, you don't have a lot of redundancy. And if you hit an iceberg, even the best ship is going to go down. And if you go down in production, you're not going to end up with a love story. It's going to be a call in the middle of the night. You're going to be very unhappy. So we have to come up with a way, of, like a better way, of actually having resiliency in a containerized environment. And probably be using something like Kubernetes, which is open source, this is part of the Linux Foundation, to do this. Um, this allows you to now have your whole fleet of ships, which are now all running, running your runtime. Now you have resiliency. If one of these ships goes down, you still have other containers or um, other runtimes where this is all running. And now you can play fun games with your, with your cluster, like um, you can play Battleship. How many, folks, how many folks played Battleship as a kid? OK, quite a number of folks. Um, sinking ships is fun. If you have redundancy in production, sinking ships can also be a lot of fun in production. Just don't sink too many, or your customers will be unhappy. And um, hopefully, you end up with a nice, busy harbor like this. OK, so this is the Amsterdam Harbor. Um, very busy harbor. Um, and you can see that getting all of these ships to be orchestrated, to be running well together, this is, this is very challenging. It's, it's hard to, to get the orchestration right. And that's why, as, a, as an industry, we've solved a lot of this problem with using, t um, using processes like DevOps. And so DevOps, hopefully, it's not like this in your company, where Dev and Ops are at each other's throats. And hopefully, you're you're working together, but I think this is best explained with a comic. So this was dev and ops historically, right? So dev would do the quick fix. They'd throw it over the wall. It would land in operations lap, and it would explode. So happy development team, right? We did our job. We checked it in, or we met our, our milestone. OK, so not, that's not so great. What about DevOps now? So we can work together. So quick fix. We hold hands with operations, and we both, we both take the hit. OK, so slight, slightly better. Now we're, now we're unified. Um, so now we, we have a new solution to this problem. It's called Dev, Dev Oops. So now we simply throw the bomb over to the customer, and the customer can test it for us. And so if you think about like um, different services you might use, some of these, it's entirely appropriate to do this. Like, um, it's not mission. Like, if you're if you lose Netflix and you can't watch your movies, you're not gonna. It's not the end of the world. And you wait like 10 or 15 minutes, and they'll roll back the servers they accidentally canary deployed on, which it didn't work on, and then you're up and running. Um, on the other hand, if you're relying on this for something mission critical, like financial trading or something like that, can't go down. Not the greatest technique for managing your. Um, your operations group. There's actually a whole conference dedicated to DevOps, and um, it's in Russia. It's called DevOps. Baruch Setogursky, the um, the head of our developer advocate CIJ Frog, is going to be speaking there. He's awesome. And um, so, if you if you want a nice trip to Russia, tell your employer you need to go to the DevOps conference. Highly recommend. But this is really what DevOps is about. It's about development and operations collaborating. This is our infinity diagram. So we plan, we code, we build, we test. This goes into releasing, deploying, operating, and monitoring. And we feed back into improvements in how we're coding our application. And through the um, collaboration of Dev and Ops, 
we can do a better job of automating the infrastructure, of handling issues we see in production with actual code fixes, improving our processes, and um, often this is, this is how a whole set of tools for treating infrastructure as code came about. Um, so it started out with tools like Puppet and Chef. Um, today you'd probably be using Ansible or Terraform for the same thing. And what these um, tools allow us to do is it allows us to automate and script all of those manual processes. And by the automation, it gives us better repeatability, better debugability, um, and improves the uptime and the operations of our, um, of our businesses. Another way of looking at this is as a continuous delivery pipeline. So you start out by building your code, right? Some sort of version control system like Git, use your agile methodologies, test-driven development, distributed version control, then you send it off to a build farm, maybe Jenkins, maybe JFrog pipelines. So you have a build server, it does all of the automated testing and analysis and moves the bits around. Um, then you get to actual testing of it with functional regression, integration, stress and load testing. And then you deploy to production, right? So you might have, like we talked about, a Kubernetes deployment or maybe some sort of application server. And then it goes into production. Now this is good. We can, we can make this picture better because one of the problems here is that we're not actually storing what goes into production. So we don't have an easy way to roll back. We don't have a way of labeling what is um, the artifacts and how they associate with the build. So um, you can archive all this stuff in something like JFrog Artifactory. This will allow you to push your builds in, use it as a container registry, use it as a, um, a storage system for your modules. And now if you need to roll back, you have all the previous versions which were in production. And we can make this even better by adding in some security. So what if you could scan your artifacts with for security vulnerabilities by doing deep scanning of the artifacts, scanning for code vulnerabilities, and then preventing things from getting into production, which are potential issues. So um, those are all things you can find out more in our booth just outside the room here. And um, what about no ops? So um, this actually is something which has come up, right? I'm an operations guy. Steve just came up on stage and told us that we're automating all the operations stuff. Do I have a job anymore? And the answer is you, you actually probably do. So from an operations standpoint, maybe before your job was pushing patches or manually deploying servers or fixing all those things, but now there's more code than ever before, there's more updates than ever before, there's more software, and now your job is doing analytics, looking at logs, looking at performance metrics, improving scalability, giving feedback to the development teams on the process, and helping to do some of the development of, of how you actually do the automated deployment. So your job has changed, it hasn't really gone away. If now, now, if more than ever before, we need more DevOps folks, we need more operations folks to keep things running smoothly. Okay, so the last topic is machine learning and AI. This is the future, right? So all of this, this technology allows us to do cool things which were not possible before because um, we're, we, we're all great developers and coders, but there are certain types of problems which are very hard for us to write a perfect algorithm for, particularly when there's large data sets, when there's complex decision making, maybe even self-driving cars, you need a way of, of actually doing this. And a technique for this is called deep learning. And the way it works is you have a system with inputs and outputs, a bunch of hidden layers in the middle, and you do some sort of reinforcement learning or some sort of model training. And over time, this complex model doing the calculations with the hidden layers, it learns and adapts just like our human brains do. And it starts to come up with the right answer for problems it hasn't seen before, which looks similar to other problems. And so one of the, um, one of the problem sets which this actually has been applied to has been gaming. Anyone play StarCraft or any other RTS game? Okay, a couple of folks in the audience. And um, now we know that the computers are better at RTS games than we are. Actually, they're better at a lot of things than us. And so they built a computer which plays StarCraft called um, AlphaStar. This was um, Google's DeepMind team. And the way it works is it gets a raw observation of the game. Here's the, the neural network, the hidden layers. 
which do the calculations, and they have a visualization of that. It considers different locations for troop movement, and then it has both a build train and an outcome prediction for um, what it thinks it's going to do in the game. And it's, it's throttled back to a human speed. So they only let the computer take as many, about as many actions as a human would take um, in the same amount of time. And so the interesting thing is that the computers, by playing against each other, they actually did a, a, a tournament with the computers. Um, the computers played for the equivalent of about 100 years in human time. So they got, they got more play time than we did. I think the game's been out for maybe seven years. Um, and in the tournament, the computers, they selected the best winners of the computer tournament to then play against human opponents. And they, the computers consistently beat the humans. And the part which they excelled at was, in particular, outcome prediction. So in a given situation, they're better at deciding whether they should engage or um, withdraw from a troop movement standpoint than us humans are. Us humans, we typically overcommit. Um, we make poor decisions in the face of um, uncertain information. And computers are a lot more logical about going through this process. Some of the machine learning frameworks you might um, use and apply would be TensorFlow from Google, CAFE, Microsoft CNTK, MXNet, Torch, DL4J, Chainer, Keras, Deano. There's new machine learning frameworks coming up almost every week. So this list keeps growing. And um, this allows you to help the computers to now take over. Because they're going to be smarter than us soon, right? There's this, this magical point at which the machines take over. And um, this, this line also, this is slightly incorrect. Because human intelligence, in my opinion, is probably going the other way. I think it's reversed. Certainly, if you look at politics, such as my country. So. If we want to calculate when this happens, there's a very simple way of looking at this, the conditions for the singularity. So one is we need a large enough data pool to model and simulate the real world. So um, if you look at humans, we've actually already passed this limit, because there's 7.2 billion humans with 6.2 billion nucleotides, which is 1 times 10 to the 19th bytes. And as of 2014, we had more than enough data to store all of the, um, all the DNA for all the humans on the planet. And if you look at all the data in the Earth, it's only 1.325 times 10 to the 37. So we'll get there very quickly. What about technology? So um, Google's current generation of tensor processing cloud machines, um, that cluster you're looking at there is their new TPU version 3. TPU version 2 did about um, 12, 12 petaflops. The new version 3 does 100 petaflops. So the machines are quickly, they're quickly getting there. They have more than enough processing power to, to pass us by. And if that doesn't work, IBM's working on quantum computers, which solves NP-complete problems and a whole different range of difficult simulations. So between those two, I think we're easily outnumbered. And the last thing is that the machines need to be able to automate production. They need to be able to automate themselves, right? 3D printer, which is 95% 3D printed. Everything except the hot end and some of the wiring is th and the fan is all 3D printed. And it can print its own parts to make a replica of itself. So once the machines can self-replicate, and they're smarter than us, and they know everything about the world, then I think, I think, we, I think we've all seen this coming, right? So this was, this was all predicted back in the, in the 80s. In the 21st century, a weapon will be invented like no other. This weapon will be powerful, versatile, and indestructible. It can't be reasoned with. It can't be bothered with. It will feel no pity, no remorse, no pain, no fear. It will have only one purpose, to return to the present and prevent the future. This weapon will be called the Terminator. OK, so we all saw this coming. Hopefully, the new Terminator movie coming out is not as bad as the last couple. But um, there you have it. So you learned about blockchain, serverless, DevOps, AIML, two other things I'm forgetting. 
Now you can go back and you can tell your friends in the office what, what technologies matter for you, what don't. And hopefully you enjoyed this presentation. So thank you guys very much for coming.